Well, good afternoon and welcome to this virtual Commonwealth Club program. I'm Lon He Chen, the David and Diane Steffi Fellow in American Public Policy Studies at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University and your moderator for today. Presently, the Commonwealth Club has suspended its in-person programming but is hosting special virtual events, including this one. You can learn more about the upcoming virtual events or become a member by visiting commonwealthclub.org. We're grateful for the generous support of our members and donors and hope you will consider making a donation online or texting donate to 415-329-4231. We also encourage you to like, subscribe, and share videos like this one with your friends and your family. During our program, we will have time for your questions. Please submit those in the chat box. Now it's my pleasure to introduce today's special guest, Jim Shudo, Emmy Award-winning journalist and author of The Madman Theory, Trump Takes on the World. Jim serves as CNN's chief national security correspondent and the co-anchor of CNN Newsroom. He's a well-respected journalist and has spent more than two decades covering historic events here and abroad. For his outstanding professional contributions, Jim has been recognized with several honors, including the Edward R. Murrow Award, the George Polk Award, and the Merriman Smith Award for excellence in presidential coverage. Please join me in welcoming Jim Shudo. Jim, uh, welcome aboard. Thanks for taking the time to do this. Th thanks for hosting. Thanks to all of you for taking time out of, out of your lives. I, I enjoyed my visit out to the Commonwealth Club last year for, for the shadow war. And it, my only regret is that we can't be seeing each other face to face now. Uh, but in the age of the Zoom call, uh, we'll make our best effort. To, and I look forward to taking everyone's questions. Well, terrific. We, we wish you could be here as well. Uh, but in the absence of that, let's let's dig in on, on your book, uh, The Madman Theory, a terrific read, uh, really a, a trip around the world uh, and a, a great examination of uh, President Trump's foreign policy and national security uh, mindset. Uh, let me just start with a general question, Jim, which is, you know, what led you to the concept for this book? Uh, How did you end up deciding to write a, a book like this? Well, in, in covering President Trump for four years, and even going back to the campaign, I heard so often from him and his allies, and I'm sure you and many folks watching this call heard the same thing, this idea of as Trump, uh, the disruptor and the brilliant strategist, uh, with this special quality of keeping everybody off balance, uh, swooping into a negotiation at the last minute with an outrageous uh, concession or demand, always having a plan, and figuring out a way to maximize leverage and come out ahead uh, unpredictably, right? You know, celebrating his unpredictability. Uh, and I saw that play out in over the last four years, as I'm sure you have witnessed, uh, in the most sensitive areas of US national security, our relationships with Russia and China and North Korea and Iran and our allies, NATO and Mexico and Canada. Uh, for, for better, perhaps, uh, and other times uh, for, for worse. But it also recalled for me uh, the previous claimant uh, to a madman theory as a strategy, and, and that, of course, Richard Nixon, um, who, and, and this is where I start the book, uh, the height uh, of the Vietnam War, really the depth of the Vietnam War in the early 70s, Nixon instructs his national security advisor, Henry Kissinger, to communicate to the North Vietnamese that he is just crazy enough, just mad enough to order a nuclear strike on North Vietnam. There are White House tapes of this. I quote the transcripts in the opening chapter where he even dictates the language to use for Kissinger to use in his conversations with the North Koreans. And he does it, he delivers those warnings. Uh, now, uh, the strategy doesn't work. It, it doesn't gain leverage. The North Vietnamese do not back down. There was no more favorable conclusion to that war. We know how the war ended. But uh, Nixon and his team came to own the strategy, even calling it the madman theory. H.R. Haldeman writes about it in his memoirs. So proudly kind of taking up that mantle. So 50 years later, we have a very different president, but claiming at least a parallel to that theory, that, that, he, that he has a plan and that part of that plan is keeping people off balance uh, and that's part of a sort of three-dimensional chess uh, approach to the world. Uh, the difference is with Donald Trump's approach, and there are a few, uh, one being he's just as likely to unleash his version of the madman theory on allies as adversaries. And we've seen it in our interactions with NATO allies, uh, with South Korea threatening to pull troops in the midst of the worsening standoff with North Korea, uh, with Canada uh, 
de de delineating Canada a national security threat, imposing steel tariffs multiple times <clears throat> in the midst of trade dispute with, among others, uh, our closest ally. Uh, and in addition to unleashing it on allies, you have a president, and you see this play out in the pages of this book, who unleashed his madman theory on his own most senior advisors, surprising them, contradicting them, making decisions against their advice uh, without any preparation and upending US policy, sometimes back and forth in serial 180s uh, uh, without their consultation and really uh, not just undermining, but suspending the national security decision-making uh, process in this country. So th that's how I uh, got to this point. Uh, and in the book, uh, I, I weave firsthand accounts from people who worked with him only at the senior levels, Trump administration officials, current and former, to see how that played out uh, and where it has left us after four years. So, uh, Jim, the, the book is a really interesting uh, series of questions or the series of questions that animate each chapter in the book. And uh, we'll talk a bit about the specific, some of the specific issue areas, some of the specific parts of the world. But uh, to begin, you sort of ask an interesting question about whether uh, Trump's foreign policy is really America first or Trump first. Uh, and, and it's an interesting question. At one point, you actually note that there may be some similarity between the way Trump looks at certain elements of foreign policy and the way that Barack Obama did when Barack Obama famously said, you know, don't do stupid stuff. That's the sanitized version since we're, uh, you know, we have an all ages audience today. So maybe talk a little bit about um, why, why the similarity and, and what the important points of difference are between the, the Obama foreign policy execution and, and Trump's. Well, here let, let's uh, give the similarities, uh, and then, of course, there are many differences. But one similarity is that uh, Obama tried to rein in, right, some of the biggest foreign deployments here. He didn't use the phrase "end the endless wars" as Trump does, but of course, he, he withdrew from Iraq. Of course, he had to go back in afterwards, and I'll tell the story later about how Trump's. Uh, policy followed a similar path really on Syria in the fight against ISIS. So, so you have that similarity there. You have um, an increasing focus on Asia. Of course, they called it uh, a pivot or a rebalancing under Obama. And the president, you know, hasn't had a single term for it. But, but certainly a, a key focus of his foreign policy has been standing up to targeting, demonizing even China. And we're, we're currently in the midst of really a spiraling escalation uh, with China there but also taking some of the sort of, um, you know, crusade element out of foreign policy, right? You know, the, the, the Obama um, bumper sticker, don't do stupid stuff, uh, being, you, you know, I don't want to say dumbing down, but certainly trimming down American ambition abroad. Um, and he took criticism of that. I quote from, you know, many liberal commentators disappointed with the Obama worldview after so many high hopes when he came into into office. Now, you know, the similarities largely end there uh, because Trump takes many of these things to, to a degree that Barack Obama never, uh, never did. I mean, for instance, you know, Donald Trump is not just uh, diminishing uh, the American position abroad, but really ending uh, American exceptionalism because he himself doesn't seem to see the U.S. as, as any different from any other player on the world stage. He has a very nihilistic view, a zero-sum view of relations with, well, Russia uh, and China, but also even our, even our closest allies. So, I mean, with respect to that zero-sum view, I think certainly you can argue um, in those two examples that's true, but, but let's start with China since that's a, a big topic these days. Um, you know, isn't the president right when he argues that, that the Chinese are in fact playing a zero-sum game? I mean, interesting piece in foreign affairs uh, that Aaron Friedberg, a professor at Princeton's just written, where essentially, you know, that's one of the points he makes, that China views the world in this way. Um, he doesn't go this far, but I mean, shouldn't the argument be, why don't we view it in the same way in our interactions with China? Hasn't the president, in fact, given us a more realistic perspective vis-a-vis uh, -vis dealing with, uh, with the People's Republic? I write about this extensively here because, because my own personal experience right. is long and deep in China and Asia spent 25, 30 years studying the place, working there as a reporter and later in government as chief of staff of the U.S. ambassador to China. And I start the China chapter in this with a personal story of being inside the U.S. embassy in Beijing 
when, uh, if you remember, or our viewers here may remember, when the U.S. took in the blind dissident Chen Guangchen, who had fled house arrest at great risk to himself and presents himself in Beijing being chased by secret police and, and calls the embassy and asks for a rescue, has to be taken in. That was not an automatic, uh, but uh, the deputy chief of mission who was in, the, the, the ambassador actually was out of the country when it happened, makes a call to Washington, gets the okay to take him in. That was a bold decision in the midst of a very sensitive superpower relationship and a proud moment for myself and other diplomats who were in the embassy at the time to see the US take that stand. But what I noticed in the days that he was in the embassy was how quickly his welcome there faded. And I remember watching him shuffled out of the embassy with something of a deal to protect himself, but one that later fell apart or very quickly fell apart. Uh, I felt that I saw the best and the worst of the US in that very short period of time. One, uh, looking to you know, back up its values by standing up for this dissident in danger, but then seemingly make a calculation that, well, the relationship's bigger than him and we don't really want to upset the Chinese too much. So from my perspective, you know, the standing up to China aspect on a whole host of things, theft of intellectual property, you know, trade malpractice, et cetera, long overdue. Now, the question is, as with so many uh, of the president's foreign policy uh, priorities is, is it working, one? And two, is it connected to a broader strategy? And by the accounts of his own most senior advisors, almost across the board, there is no big picture strategy. It is more a series of decisions, often in the moment, by a president who likes to contradict not only the best advice of his advisors, uh, but stated U.S. policy, and often the intelligence or information he has before him. So, you know, what I try to do in this book is take each of these fields of play, right, and relationships, and see if his madman theory brought us to a safer place today than we were four years ago. And when you look at it uh, by those hard metrics, by and large, the answer is no. So, I mean, with respect to China, one of the... Um... <clears throat> vignettes are one of the things that that you talk about very early in the book is um, is a is a phone call that the president ends up taking from the president of Taiwan. Mm -hmm. uh, not something that uh, U.S. presidents have generally done. Uh, our relations with Taiwan have been informal and ambiguous for a very very long time, and arguably for for good reason. Um, is that an example of the madman theory at work, or you know, is there something more to that particular incident? Well, I start off the book with a series of decisions by this president that, that if anybody is surprised by the way he has run foreign policy, they shouldn't be because, well, first of all, back on the campaign trail, he was saying things like this, uh, but also in, in his very first days in office, he was blowing up the script, right? Like you say, speaking directly to the Taiwanese head of state, which is a, you know, putatively a violation of the one, the one China policy. Um, and it's interesting as that happens because you know, it pretty clearly was a spur of the moment decision without preparation or debate in the situation room, et cetera, as are so many of his decisions. So the first reaction from the White House was, you know, as, as people were saying, what the heck is going on? Are you, are you going to end the one China policy was, well, listen, he's a new president. Uh, he's not attuned to the, the rules of play and, and so on in Washington. He's a disruptor, et cetera, you know, forgive him kind of thing. This is just the way He's doing it early, early on. But then over a couple of days, they came to own it. The president said, no, absolutely. I meant to take that call. And then suddenly you have Kellyanne Conway saying this was the plan all along. You know, it was one of those kind of uh, retroactive, um, you know, claims of a policy process, which didn't exist. But you have other ones as well. I mean, the, the Muslim ban, right? I mean, this was an outrageous um, campaign promise that he followed through on, you know. Um, the moving of the Jerusalem, you know, the, the Israeli embassy or the U.S. embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. And that one's notable because um, he did that, again, over the advice uh, of many advisors. And despite the fact that his intelli the intelligence agencies were, were predicting that there would be enormous outrage in the Middle East, days and weeks and months of rage and terror attacks, etc. And Susan Gordon tells a good story of, of his thought process on that. When that didn't happen, I mean, there was protest, but, but it didn't blow up. The president, you know, the president's uh, desire and, and compunction to kind of 
uh, break with his senior advisors became emboldened. He's like, look, you told me that was going to be that big, de- big a deal. You know, it, it didn't it didn't go anywhere. I'm not listening to you guys anymore. And and she describes a president sort of increasingly unleashed over time. What is the right way for us to understand the president's relationship with his senior advisors in national security? I mean, I, this is a complex question, obviously, because there are some characters who clearly uh, align very closely with Trump's view of the world, or at least it would seem people like Peter Navarro, who uh, whose portfolio is far, far broader than just trade, uh, as you and others know. Um, you know, and others like, um, you know, Jim Mattis, let's say, or H.R. McMaster, or others who, um, Rex Tillerson, who have been in the administration and, and are, not, uh, are not there anymore. How are we to understand um, how he thinks about those relationships and how meaningful some of those relationships are? The simplest metric for the president is loyalty, right? Doing his bidding. And, and we've seen one by one, the senior advisors who are willing if not all the not all the time, just occasionally to differ with him, contradict him, they're gone or mostly gone, either shamed over time, sidelined over time, or summarily fired. Uh, Mattis is not one who resigned, you know, in the wake of the president's first summary withdrawal from Syria. He had reached his limit. So some folks reach their limit. Others are pushed out, shamed out, scared out. I mean, look at the end of Alexander Vindman's military career. Um, you know, look at Marie Yovanovitch, right? You know, the subject of a character assassination campaign by her own government. Um, so that is the number one criteria at the top of the resume for anybody in the Trump administration, agree with him and do his bidding. And you've seen over time that folks who are willing to, to contradict him, they disappear. And he's, he's increasingly surrounded by yes men or acting secretaries without Senate approval, folks who will do is bidding and not and not speak and and, and you know the sad fact you have this reporting recently about this Potemkin village being built around him on COVID to supply him with a frankly misleading view of the world that feeds his own assumptions. It's a I mean it's it's an emperor has no clothes moments happening before our eyes. You know, but Jim, you've covered uh, presidents and, and you, you've covered administrations for a long time. What is so unusual, I guess? I mean, there's a part of this which is the president's entitled to have people around him who agree with him and who he trusts and who he believes will serve him faithfully and well. Uh, How do you differentiate that notion from what you perceive is happening or what you write about what's happening in this administration? It's a matter of degree, really, isn't it? Of course, you know, on all these things, some presidents have lied before, but they don't lie 20,000 times, right, on on things that that are just abjectly false. And yes, presidents have wanted loyal servants around them or, or loyal advisors, uh, but they don't, um, in general, or to, or, or to the degree that President Trump does, treat whole institutions as instruments of his will, right? Investigate the people I want you to investigate, Justice Department, and exonerate the ones I want you to exonerate. Um, he had the EPA this week change showerhead standards because apparently he wants a stronger flow in the shower. I mean, it's, if you and I were writing a novel about this, you know, we would, we would pat ourselves on the back for coming up with that image as, as, as like an ironic one, but it's, it's happening before us. So, you know, it's a matter of degree and with de- deleterious effects over time in terms of how these institutions function. I mean, look at the intelligence agencies. Um, you know, the, the, the DNI role, Director of National Intelligence, was created one for a qualified intelligence professional and look at the people who have filled the job you know uh, jim clapper 50 years in intelligence um uh and and expressly to take politics out of intelligence right because of the the lesson of how politics influenced the intelligence leading up to the iraq invasion uh and to avoid another 9-11 the president deliberately puts a political operative in that role with no intelligence experience and rick Rennell, who then proceeds to have a Kind of loyalty purge. So again, folks have put allies in these positions, but he has he has turned those positions and those institutions or attempted to in, into things that he can mold to his will. One of the things you explore in the book is um, how President Trump's foreign policy views have impacted our relationships with friends and allies around the world. You know, this is something that 
uh, arguably the success in our ability, for example, to deal with, uh, with China, with some of these other issues does depend on our ability to work with countries around the world who agree with us. Uh, a question from the audience, which I think is, is an interesting one. Um, how do you sort of assess where things stand in terms of some of our key relationships with friends and allies around the world? And to the extent there have been, um, there's been some breakage or there's been some issues there, how do we fix it? So let's start with the, the state of damage. There, there's real damage done. And, and don't, don't rely on me to say that. I mean, his, his people I quote in the book and, and who, by the way, and this is notable, they speak on the record. Uh, largely, which is a difficult thing to do in Washington, as you know, they speak in, on the record, but also look at the comments of our allies. Let's take NATO. Uh, it takes a lot for the leaders of Germany and France, our decades-long allies, allies, to say they can no longer rely on the U.S. As, as a security partner. That's a remarkable thing to say. Yes, uh, the president has gotten, has squeezed more money out of them, something that, that Obama and Bush sought to as well, but at the same time, he's damaged the fabric of the alliance. You know, an alliance is only as good as uh, its members' belief in it, but also your adversary's belief in it. And when the president raises open questions in public about whether he would abide by, you know, the mutual defense clause of NATO, Article 3, uh, the last time of which it was invoked was after 9-11 in our defense, when he raises that question, what are the allies to think? What is Estonia to think, NATO ally on the border of Russia? Will, will, will the U.S. really come to our defense? And more importantly, arguably, what is Russia to think? You know, let's look at South Korea. The, the president, I tell the story in here, you know, in the midst of a worsening standoff with North Korea, is simultaneously squeezing South Korea for five times the funds for U.S. troops there while instructing his aides to threaten to remove US forces from there is kind of a cudgel to beat them over the head, if not all of them, some of them. Um, which, and this, is, this goes back to that point of, you know, is Trump playing some sort of three-dimensional chess here, chess here? By doing that, he's weakening not only South Korea's position against North Korea, because they raise the question, how loyal is the US as an ally for them, but also his own negotiating position with Kim Jong-un. Uh, and by the way, you know, North Korea is a bigger, not a smaller nuclear power after four years of Trump. So those relationships are damaged. And then again, it undermines some of the president's own objectives. For instance, standing up to Chinese malign activities, much stronger with allies on board. You know, your trade war in, with China would have been stronger if you had, for instance, the TPP, or at least you tried to rally allies around it rather than fight them at the same time. So, uh, you know, those alliances are, are damaged. How do you get that back? You know, whether it's in three months or four years, uh, a new president could say a lot of things and, and, and restate those commitments. But it does raise a question about diplomacy in the age of our supremely partisan politics, mm. th that people around the world can make a decent assumption that, okay, that's what you're telling me now. What happens after the next election? You know, can they rely on some of these positions bridging the parties and the elections. And, and the president has raised some real questions about that. You know, there are things that uh, President Trump has done in his foreign policy uh, that I, I, I would pretty, feel pretty comfortable saying no other Republican president would have done, even if that president uh, to be had felt the same way. You know, I've worked in Republican politics for a long time. I've known about this idea of taking the embassy to Jerusalem, the Israel, the em our embassy in Israel to Jerusalem, uh, the notion of uh, trying to deal with North Korea. You know, I'm pretty sure that others may have wanted to to figure out a way to that uh, to solve that problem. Probably would not have sat down with Kim Jong Un without preconditions. Um, so there are a bunch of these things he's done. Um, do you, in the book, you explore these things. Do, do, in any of these situations, do you think we're better off because of the, the kind of approach that Trump has taken in, in, in these areas? Well, what I do at the end of the book is, is I do a before and after. Here's what he inherited and here's what he's leaving after four years. And look at a North Korea. Um, his first year is all fire and fury, which by the way, brought us to the brink of war. I'll get to that in a second because I, I talk about that in the book. Um, and then three years of, of the bromance. Um, each approach is not without foundation, right? I mean, you, you need to show North Korea military strength. It's, it's a power, you know, it's sunk 
South Korean ships. It's uh, launched, you know, missiles, etc. Um, and like you say, uh, diplomacy. There's nothing wrong with diplomacy, right? But connected to a broader strategy. The thing is, in each instance, um, he, you know, you know, the approach failed in that. Um, well, you brought. Actually, his aides will say that the, the, the maximum pressure of the fire and fury brought North Korea to the table. You can make an argument for that. There are others involved who said that really that was North Korea's calculation, that they had reached the level they wanted in their nuclear program. So they made the decision. Let's leave that to debate. But, but let's look at what three years of summit diplomacy did, because as you said, you know, the typical way to, to do a summit is to have some sort of agreement at the lower level before, or at least some concessions. What you found is Trump was making all the concessions, North Korea was not, canceling exercises, for instance, and then uh, you know, relying on his personal relationship uh, with Kim to fundamentally upend the calculus of North Korea against the best intelligence assessments about what North Korea was willing to give up and what it was not. And what you know, the suspicion of his closest advisors throughout was they're playing us, they're gonna stretch this out and continue to build their nuclear program, which by the way, is exactly what happened. So, so four years later, North Korea has more, not fewer nuclear weapons. It has a more, not less advanced ballistic missile program and is more of a threat to the US. So when you look at it in a sense of before and after, that's what you're left with. Look at Iran. I mean, anybody could say reasonably, you have to stand up to Iran's military aggression in the region and Anyone could say, I wish we got a better Iran nuclear deal. Okay, tell me what you're replacing it with because today Iran is closer, not further away from a nuclear weapon. And I recount in the story how the Pentagon did its own assessment of the Iran strategy and found and delivered that message to the president that it had failed. One, closer to a nuclear weapon. Two, Iran's aggression in the region has gone up, not down. So, you know, going in, you understand the compulsion to try to change, challenge the relationship with North Korea or Iran, for instance. Um, so then what's the strategy to get it into a better place? Never clearly articulated, and the bottom line four years later is it didn't achieve what the president said he wanted to. How unusual do you think that is? I mean, as you look at other administrations in recent history, how, how unusual is it sort of to, uh, to have a posture where you know what you don't like, yeah, uh, but you know, maybe falls fall a little bit short in terms of what you actually do like or want. Administrations fail all the time, you know, and that's a thing to keep in mind. You know, I talk talk to Peter Navarro in the book and and Steve Bannon as well to get a sense of why they're true believers, right? Um, and and Navarro has a biting quote in the book. He's like, you know, what has the establishment gotten right in this town in a long time? You know, and it's a it's a little, you know. Peter Navarro speaks in you know, very colorful terms, so it's a little overstated, but the Iraq war, you know, a gross failure. The, the relationship with China, although it, it did cause a lot of mutual benefit economically, you could make that case, but, but over time, successive administrations didn't figure out a way. They had a dream in their mind of guiding China to a more positive role in the world, and, and they failed, right? So, you, you know, if you're trying to run on the record of previous administrations, uh, as having some brilliant wisdom. And I'm not saying they're all failures because there are other places where there were some successes. Um, uh, but if, if you're running on the idea that the establishment is, is always right, you know, you're not gonna win an argument with these guys. The trouble is, as with so much Trump, what did you then replace it with? I mean, it's like, it's like Obamacare for the world. Okay, you don't think Obamacare is good enough. You said for four years, you have a better plan. Where is it? You know, you have a better approach to North Korea. Where is it? You have a better Iran nuclear deal. Where is it? You know, it's you know, it's one thing to be the bull in the China shop, but eventually you got to put all the China back together, right? So um, here's a, a question that uh, that that speaks to kind of this idea that you know there are things maybe that this president has done that other presidents would not have uh, you know either dared to do or wanted to do, uh, and that is today's news about what's happening with Israel and the UAE. Um, yeah. How uh, significant do you think that is? Is that something that, uh, you know, in your view, truly is is something that could have only been accomplished by Trump, or was that something in the works for some time? It was, you know, it, it's it's remarkable. I mean, in, in all these things, th th there were things that happened here that, regardless of the administration, 
folks would celebrate the killing mm -hmm. of Baghdadi, right? The yes. leader of ISIS. Um, you know, no one is mourning the loss of Qasem Soleimani. Mm -hmm. uh, now, there, there, there's concern about whether there's some, you know, conflagration to follow. You know, Iran sometimes delays its retaliation, but, but at least immediately there was not the, you know, the great explosion that, that many had predicted. Um, so, so you have to give credit where, where credit is due. Um, and when you look at this, you know, the, the Mideast peace plan, Jared Kushner's secret deal never went anywhere, right? But peace with the UAE is something. Um, and the president has found, uh, you know, a, a partnership with the Gulf states, right? You know, the relationship with Saudi Arabia and, and now this, um, that has been at a cost to some degree, right? Um, the, watching the war in Yemen, for instance, and supplying arms that were used there. Uh, so, you know, Saudi Arabia judging that it can kill dissidents abroad, right? <laughs> and without punishment from its ally US, you know, the president just dismissing that as an issue. So there, there are real costs to this with other consequences. Um, but that's not to diminish the importance of Israel making peace with a with a Muslim state. Um, just sort of to continue our our uh, our trip around the world, as as it were, we were talking earlier about China. One of the topics that you uh, that you discuss at some length is Russia, and mm -hmm. you know, kind of what's going on with President Trump and his view of Russia. You lay out some alternate theories about why it is that the president may be dealing with Russia in the way he is. Maybe talk a little bit about those theories and is there one you think is most compelling? So I asked everyone I interviewed for this book and all who served him at the senior level to explain his deference to Russia because arguably the most consistent feature of his foreign policy is deference to Russia. And, and he and his allies will say, no one's been tougher on Russia than Trump. It's just not true. You know, the, the record shows many instances where he yielded, right? From denying military aid to Ukraine, to, to failing to call out Russian interference in the election, not once, but twice, right? It's happening again, you know, to help him again, uh, to slow rolling uh, sanctions against Russia and, and only really his hand forced uh, by large bipartisan majorities in Congress. So, so I asked everybody who worked for him, tell me, why does he have this special relationship with Putin? And the best explanation they could come up with, and this is based on experience, is that he has an inexplicable admiration for Putin. For Putin the man, uh, but also uh, Putin's power. He has envy of Putin's power. Uh, and in addition to that, he and Putin share something of a nihilistic worldview, uh, that, that it is a zero-sum game, uh, that we're all dirty players in a dirty game. Uh, one of the chapters of my book is called The End of American Exceptionalism because the president in his public and private comments does not believe that the US is necessarily any better than our adversaries in the way it plays in the international sphere. Some of this is in his public comments. Look at mm -hmm. you know, the Bill O'Reilly interview uh, when O'Reilly said to him, this is a couple of weeks into his term, you know, but Putin's a killer. He said, well, are we that great? More recently with the intelligence regarding uh, Russian bounties, uh, paying bounties on US soldiers in Afghanistan and uh, selling arms to the Taliban back in 2018 to kill US soldiers, mind you. The president's response to that was, well, we sold weapons to the Taliban in the 80s when Russia was there, a an equivalency between the two. So that by itself is remarkable enough. A, a president sharing a worldview, a US president with the leader of an authoritarian state, Russia, and an adversary, by the way. But in addition to that, his closest advisors, including intelligence officials said that Russia is aware of his admiration for Putin. Putin is aware of that admiration and seeks to take advantage of it as a result. I did, intelligence officials in this book describe how their concern uh, was that Russia was carrying out, in effect, an influence operation on Trump. You know, it's a term for espionage, but, but an operation to influence his view of the world and influence his decision making. Uh, one intel official said we were concerned Russia was trying to recruit Trump, not as a secret agent, but as a friend. And they saw that play out even in his worldview. Um, uh, senior administration officials told me that uh, a source of the president's hostility for European leaders, Western European leaders, the leaders of our allies there, is Putin himself. They're simpatico on that issue. Uh, even President Trump's understanding of the origins of World War II influenced by Russia's revisionist history of the origins of World War II. Forget the 
Molotov Ribbentrop Pact, right? You know, he, he talks about Russia in terms as always a, a white hat in that war. And that has consequences in his decision. Just to give you an example, president reducing the force presence in Germany against the advice of everyone in, in his government, in the Pentagon, and even on Capitol Hill among Republicans. Why? Mm -hmm. And the best explanation among his advisors is, is he wants to stick his thumb in the eye of Angela Merkel with big consequences. I mean, you could look at that as a success from Putin's influence up on the president. It's a, it's a remark. And, you know, of course, people harbor deeper suspicions about more nefarious things about the president. And some people shared those ideas with me, but, but they didn't have the proof for it. So I didn't include it in there. So, so I included purely what they witnessed and, and what they judged based on his conversations and dealings with Putin. What about Ukraine? Uh, you know, you, uh, you spend a chapter talking about Ukraine. Uh, is it as simple as a situation where um, the, the president arguably has subsumed the national interest in personal interest? Is, is that really the best way to understand what happened there? Yeah. I mean, no one tells a different story except the president of that. No one involved tells a different story. And it's in the records from the impeachment hearings, many of which I quote, but it's also uh, of, uh, from my own interviews with Fiona Hill and others uh, describing this. And, and, you know, you can say, well, how do you really know that? I mean, first of all, based on their sworn testimony and how it played out, but also because when you look at Ukraine, you can see uh, that that's not isolated. It's how this president operates in other spheres. Uh, Bolton's book talking about his asking Xi Jinping for help in the election by buying uh, agricultural products in swing states. You know, if nothing else, President Trump is an open book on these things. I mean, even right now, is, is it some diabolical secret plan that the president wants to slow down the mail service to, to impede mail-in voting, which he calculates hurts him in the election? No, he said it on Fox this morning. You know, this is the thing is that, you know, you, you could, there's no mystery to the way he operates. Um, it's, it's in his public comments and it's in the decisions that he makes. You know, it's interesting, uh, Fiona Hill um, talks about the hyper-personalization of the presidency uh, under Trump. Um, you know, the policy is Trump, Trump is the policy. Uh, and, and she's, so here's the student of Russia who has studied, studied Putin for years and dealt with him face to face, who said that amazingly, Trumpism, that, that Putinism involves more delegation of authority than Trumpism does. You know, they spread, I mean, it's an authoritarian state, but they spread some of the decision-making around under Trump. It's more and more concentrated through him. That's a remarkable thing to hear uh, for, for someone who served him at the highest levels and make that comparison to Putinism. You mentioned the, the Bolton book, and I, I was been struck actually by how many books have been written already from you know, former administration officials that in some way uh, you know, paint a portrait of, of, of the president? All, all these books, certainly you would expect them to, but the amount of detail, the amount of sort of specificity we learn about how the policymaking process works. Um, do you attribute that to, uh, I mean, what do you attribute that to? I mean, is it a cultural thing at the White House? Is it, I mean, what, what is it that sort of facilitates and allows for, uh, people like John Bolton to come out and write the book, frankly, that he wrote. Well, by the way, you could buy my book and then you won't have the guilt of buying. Uh, right. <laughs> you blame him for not, uh, for not testifying. Uh, just a little pitch there for folks listening at home. Um, but uh, why is the portrayal of him so consistent by people who work for him? The simplest answer is because it's true, right? You know, the, the, the one common thread through these accounts I mean, there are multiple common threads to the accounts. Doesn't read, uh, believes he knows better than everyone around him, um, will deny facts if they don't fit his, uh, his view or are inconvenient, like the deaths of 164,000 people in a country, right? Uh, he'll ignore data. He will often mix the national interests with his own personal interests. Reelect me, what, um, let me deny military aid to an ally at war here fighting Russia because it could get me some dirt on my political opponent, right? Um, you know, the, the tales of Trump from Tillerson, uh, Bolton, uh, the, you know, read my book, McMaster, Joseph Yun, you know, a North Korea negotiator, the folks in the Pentagon who dealed with Iran across the board is the same. 
You know, it's funny, I talk about this in the book, you know, Nikki Haley, who is probably the one Trump administration official who left with her with her pride in hand, right, and her career in hand, because most of them leave, you know, in, in tatters, you know, because Trump kind of turns on them in general. Um, you know, in her book, she talks about this instance where, where some cabinet members came to her with the idea of exercising the 25th Amendment. She yeah. rejected it. And what struck me about it, you know, her putting that in her book, I imagine, was um, to get the message across that she stood in the way of that, right? But what she was also doing was concern, confirming that early in his term, senior members of his administration thought he might need to be removed from office. You know, it's... Um, you know, these are not outlier positions. Uh, you know, all these people could have written the anonymous article at the end of the day, right? When you th- when you see what they've said in public. Um, by the way, I want your your guess as to who the anonymous article is, but we could do that later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, it is um, it, it is fascinating. You know, all of these accounts do have a certain element of of consistency to them. Mm. Uh, you, you know, I, I guess one thing that um, that I'm curious about is, as you you interviewed you know a number of different people for this book, was there a revelation or a uh, comment from someone that surprised you that you weren't expecting to hear but did in the course of doing these interviews? One that really caught me was uh, explaining one big consequence of Trump's madman theory and his unpredictability is a senior Intel official told me that, that our adversaries know um, that we don't know the next play. That's mm-hmm. the way this person described it. They know that our president is unpredictable and that it's, it's not part of some strategy that at least the people around him in government or the people who serve him as the heads of major agencies know. They know that this is sort of chaos, right, in, in terms of decision-making here, and seek to take advantage of that. And, and there is, there's an enormous paper tiger quality to, to the Trump presidency, going back to the way he did business or the way he even, you know, starred on The Apprentice, right? This projection of power um, and this claim that people respect that power and are intimidated by it, when in reality they don't. You know, Kim played Trump. Uh, Putin has played Trump, gotten more, not less aggressive. China is in the midst of a battle with Trump. We'll see who comes out winner on, on the other side, if there is a winner. Uh, Erdogan played Trump. In two phone calls, he got Trump to do his bidding, really. Trump thought he was making the decision, but it was certainly not a decision uh, supported by his own government or in line with U.S. stated national security policy. You know, that it's... Uh, you know, this idea that this madman theory has scared or shocked our adversaries into doing our bidding, it just, it's just not true. It's just not how it's played out. It's certainly not how they view, view his presidency, at least, again, according to people who work for him. Um, recent reports suggest that uh, some of our adversaries out there have preferences when it comes to the presidential election. Yeah. Um, how do you how do you interpret uh, what we're hearing there? And I mean, do you do you find those assessments credible? I found it fairly convenient that on the same day that the intelligence community repeats its 2016 assessment that Russia is interfering and again interfering to benefit Donald Trump, that they attach. And by the way, China and Iran they don't want Donald Trump to win. Okay. For one, here's a question of degree, right? So in 2016, and it is true, by the way, that that China, North Korea, and Iran all interfere in our political process. And that's in all the intel briefings. I've spoken to the folks who've been briefed. It becomes a question of degree, right? Because there's no question that in 2016, Russia intervened more aggressively, um, far more publicly, uh, you know, stealing DNC emails and strategically releasing them to undermine the the Democratic National Convention, stealing John Podesta's emails, strategically releasing them in the days leading up to the election. I always remind people, you know, the first Podesta email dump came 22 minutes after the Access Hollywood call dropped. That was intentional, divert attention. Who do you think they were supporting with that? So again, you have Russia intervening to help Trump and hurt, this time Joe Biden, uh, and quite openly so, you've got this uh, 
Russian-backed or Ukrainian politicians supply, supplying dirt. And, and you know, a remarkable new aspect is that you have US lawmakers taking part in it willfully, right? They're the new middleman for this. There's no WikiLeaks, you don't need a WikiLeaks. If you have a direct line to Ron Johnson and Devin Nunes on, on the relevant committees, um, so I don't doubt that China and Iran are intervening. I don't know how they judge that they prefer uh, Trump to lose. I've been told by uh, many China watchers that China sees enormous advantage in Trump because of the disarray he's created in this country. By the way, and I quote this in the book, that, that the Chinese who used to talk about overcoming the U.S. or surpassing it in 2049 on the 100th anniversary of the founding of the Communist Party now have moved up the timeline to some degree, in, in part uh, because of the, the sort of mayhem that, that the U.S. has been going through. That's even pre-COVID. So, you know, my spidey sense uh, tingled a bit when I saw the way that Intel uh, report was released, as if it's, uh, well, yeah, you've got, it's sort of like a kind of classic Trump, both sides things. Well, you've got your, you know, folks who are trying to help you, and I got my folks who are trying to help me. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things, uh, you know, China, I think, has been emboldened by what they what they perceive to be a decline in American democracy, the, mm -hmm. the democratic norms being eroded works in favor of their argument that, you know, democracy maybe isn't so great after all. Yeah. Um, what's your view on where the relationship with China is headed? I mean, as you've noted, you you have tremendous experience in country uh, looking at these issues over time, as you view it today, um, is this decoupling new Cold War dynamic? Is that something that is specific to the Trump administration? In other words, if Biden wins, we're going right back to where we were for the last 15, 20 years. Or, you know, are we really in a new normal? I'd love your thoughts, too, on that. I think that, uh, one, if Biden is elected, I don't think we're going back, certainly not to the way it was. Uh, that th there is, you know, one of the few things there's bipartisan agreement on, right, is, is that China is a bad actor, right, in trade uh, and elsewhere. So I don't see a uh, return to that status quo. Um, the concerning thing about what's going on right now is that we're in a, we're in a sort of spiral of escalation now, uh, tit for tat and kind of one-upping on a whole host of, you know, in the business sphere, there's a lot of military hardware working in very close proximity now out in Asia. And, you know, the closer you get, the closer you get to miscalculation. Um, there's a question as to how much of this ratcheting up is election driven. Trump wanting to be seen as tough in this period of time, uh, how much that is influencing that or exacerbating that. The trouble is it's hard to kind of dial that kind of stuff back because China is not a wilting flower in this extremely confident leadership uh, and aggressive. Um, so what is the strategy? What is the end game? And, and as with so many things, Trump is full of uh, rash decisions, but not necessarily tied together in some way. Does he have a diplomatic off-ramp? Does he have a goal in mind that will satisfy him and he'll call it a win and then move on to the next thing and kind of normalize relations again? It's not clear. Right now, you know, we're kind of spinning in a direction that, that, that can be dangerous. Yeah, I, I do think, uh, Jim, that the, the situation with China has reached sort of a, a, a new stasis, that even if there is a new administration, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I, I don't think we're going back. And I think some of it's a recognition of mm -hmm. China's behavior, some of it's an understanding of where we are. But I do think that, you're, that, that, that we're gonna see much more careful calibration of where the relationship goes in some ways. And that unpredictability you speak about in your book, I do think is a hallmark of, of this administration and will continue vis-a-vis -vis China even after the election. Um, speaking of the election, uh, you know, one of the things that I I've noticed in most presidential elections is that foreign policy really doesn't play that big of a role. Um, there have been a few national security elections, I think back to 2004, the bush Kerry election, I think was a national security election. What role do you see national security playing, if any, in, in this race we're seeing uh, right now? Well, typically, you know, it's the economy stupid, right? And if you're in the midst of the biggest economic slowdown since the Depression, you have to imagine that's the driving force for most people, in addition to the health crisis and all the carry-on effects of that and the mismanagement of that. Um, you can argue, and I do in the book, that the pandemic... Uh, first of all, his response to the pandemic fits with his larger madman theory approach. And I try to 
crystallize that a bit at the end, um, the, the aspects, the features of that. I'll, I'll do that, just repeat that in a moment, but before I get there, that a, that a pandemic is a national security problem and it's a, it's a global problem. It's a foreign policy problem because by its nature it is global. And you know, to truly get a handle on it, you do need uh, cooperation with others and so on, which you know, the, the, this president hasn't shown much, much interest in. You know, in effect, it's the, it's the national security crisis that has arrived on people's doorsteps in a way that Ukraine or even the Iranian you know, missile program or the North Korean nuclear program that was not, you know, people could kind of keep that at an arm's length. But when you've lost your job or your grandmother's died uh, or your kids can't go to school, you know, you have a very personal experience of it. I will say it's funny, you know, as, as I was finishing up the manuscript is as this pandemic was worsening. So I went back to all of my interviewees and I asked them about the president's handling of it. And all of them said, boy, I mean, we're seeing all the elements uh, of Trump's America first madman theory play out now with the pandemic. And I, you know, in, in, the, in the last chapter, I try to crystallize that. And you see it. One is minimize, you know, minimize the crisis. It's not that big a deal. I got it. I alone can solve it. Uh, two, politicize. Everything is political. Anybody who disagrees with my approach or even draws attention to this, uh, they're the Democrats, they're the, the radical left, you know, it's a hoax. Uh, demonize the experts, you know, just as likely to, you know, dismiss a Fauci on hydroxychloroquine as he is the intel community on Russian election interference. But finally, personalize this hyper personalization of the presidency. And we've seen that play out in spades uh, with the pandemic. Do you have a view? I mean, let's just assume, uh, you know, the, the, the president is, is uh, leaves office in January. What do you think the legacy of his foreign policy will be? Messy, right? And again, just doing this straight up before and after. Uh, the approach to North Korea failed. Uh, the approach to Iran failed, at least in its state, you know, both of their stated goals. Remember the, the administration's goal on North Korea, they stopped using this acronym, uh, you know, uh, complete, right. verifiable, irreversible denuclearization. When's the last time you heard that? You know, we're nowhere near any of those, those letters of that acronym. Um, we were going to get you a better Iranian nuclear deal. We haven't gotten that. We were going to stand up to Russia. Uh, Russia has increased its malign activities, not decreased them. I mean, look at what's happening in Belarus right now. China, yes, confronting the bad behavior. Um, the question there, as with all these things, is what is the end game, right? Um, you know, China has enormous leverage over the U.S. Uh, half of GM sales are in China. Um, Boeing's biggest growth market is China. Without that, uh, you know, the U.S. can be punished as well. Um, so you you have a series. Listen, let's name the successes, right? The, right. the, the, the destruction of ISIS was accelerated right. under Trump. Trouble is, as I said, you know, he's almost unwittingly undermined his own success there by pulling troops out, almost Obama style, right? You know, giving a window to uh, them, them coming back. If he follows through on his plan to bring the US force presence down in Afghanistan to zero, what happens if you have a resurgence of, of Al Qaeda? On many of these things, you don't know until years later, right? Sometimes you know immediately, sometimes you don't know until years later, but, but, at, but at best, uh, what we know so far, uh, you have a lot of places where he failed to meet his own goals. Um, what, one of the things you know, that strikes me, China is an example of this. There are a number of issues where I think Trump has tried to triangulate a, a populist position in national security, if you will. H how do you think that has impacted where the Democrats are and mm -hmm. how you know, Democratic leaders think about foreign policy, national security? I mean, there's some areas where I think they probably would be in agreement as a general matter with what Trump is trying yeah. to do. They might not agree. It, it seems to me that when I hear a lot of these critiques, they're not critiques of substantive goals. They're critiques of style and maybe the way that we would we would get there. Right. Um, is that accurate? Do you do you kind of see there being a little bit more there in terms of what the alternative is the Democrats are trying to to sell on this? Well, there are differences that are more than style, right? I mean, for instance, if you look at uh, the relationship with Russia, uh, you know, the excusing of bad behavior by Saudi Arabia, you know. Um, the undermining of the NATO alliance, you know, so, so there's some, you know, there are many things that are more than style. I do think that some, you know, China, the end of the old status quo with China will last, right, both parties. How they calibrate that, open question, but 
that's not going to go back. Um, the you know some of this going back to Obama, it's not just Trump, but but the end of large scale U.S. military entanglements in the Middle East probably over. I mean, unless you know, God forbid, you have another 9/11, right? And then you have to kind of reverse, as both Obama and Trump had to reverse to some degree, right? Uh, when things came back. Um, let's see what else. I mean, it's interesting. It would be interesting to see what you do with Iran in the next presidency. Do, do you go back to the negotiating table? Do you reboot the Iran nuclear deal? Would Iran even accept that? Why would they trust it? You know, I mean, how do I know if you guys sign this again that the next guy is not yeah. is, is going is gonna to stay in? But some of those are lasting. Um, trying to think if I'm missing anything else uh, that's big picture. Um, I think those are the big ones. Oh, well, no, uh, relationship with Israel, right? Right. You know, the Trump administration is, you know, basically green-lighted annexation of the West Bank, you know, the West Bank, you know, is the two-state solution as a as a uh, bedrock, if you want to call it that, of the U.S. policy in the Middle East. Is that is that done for good? It's possible. Yeah, I mean, it is interesting because I do think we have given um, both our allies and our adversaries around the world reason to question the durability of policy that's made, you know, whether it's policy that we're seeing domestically, policy toward other countries, how changeable, it, it, things seem very changeable, very malleable, very a la minute. Yeah. Yeah. In a, in, in a lot of ways. And I do think, I do think that ends up being a challenge. We have just a few minutes left. I want to ask you um, about, you know, if you could go and add a chapter to your book now, mm. now that you've, you, I'm, I'm sure the last thing you want to do is write more after you've just written this whole book, but <laughs> what, what would the, what would you add? You know, what's an event? Would, you, would it be COVID? Would it be some yeah. other foreign policy area that you've seen develop since, since the manuscript was completed? Well, I managed to get COVID in just under the yep. line. I clearly could have expanded that and carried it forward. Uh, uh, but uh, in terms of a big piece, I mean, actually Afghanistan, right? Because a lot of this mm. is developed about, you know, the, the president wants to negotiate our way out of that country, possibly by election day, right? Yeah. You know, after 20 years and to cede the country back to the Taliban largely over the uh, objections of, of our ally, really, I mean, they're not comfortable with this. I think that deserve, given, given all the, the, the blood spilled on that soil and, and the, the reason why we went in there as a country and how you would, would leave, I, I think that would be, that'd be one I'd like to do. Maybe that's the next book. There, there, there's always opportunity for, 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 for the next book. Um, let me wrap up with this question, which is, uh, and I, I like to ask, you know, pretty much everyone this, what keeps you up at night these mm. days as you think about, I mean, you've just written this book on national security issues. There's all sorts of different things, I suppose, that could keep one up at night when you're thinking about these issues, but national security or otherwise, um, as you look ahead, what, what keeps you up at night now that you've written this book and you know a little bit more and have a perspective on uh, the president, his administration, and the execution of foreign policy? I worry about my country being consumed in partisan politics to, to the point that we can't solve big problems anymore. You know, so divided, so lacking a sense of common purpose. Um, exacerbated and fueled by Trump, but it didn't begin with Trump, right? Um, you know, this has exposed a lot of things that have been there for a while, probably exacerbated them. And I'm an optimist by nature, and I do have belief in, in so many people in our country. We come into contact with them every day in government, in the military, in business, in our kids' schools, you know, walking down the street, you know. Um, but I worry that there are structural issues right now in our country that uh, worry me. And it, it'll take a real concerted effort to solve that, you know? And I got three kids and I, and I want the mm -hmm. best for them. And, and I worry uh, that we've lost our way in that sense. And it's gonna require good leadership and sacrifice and courage and shared purpose to get over that. And, and I hope we do. Well, Jim, it's a phenomenal book. It's, uh, it's well-written, uh, you know, precisely argued. I think you've got some great, uh, vignettes in there, great interviews with with people. Some of whom I'm surprised they uh, they spoke to you, uh, but they but they did and were quite candid. Uh, I, I think in their approach 
um, particularly those who support the president. So, so we thank you, Jim, uh, author of Madman Theory, Trump Takes on the World for your time today. Thanks so much, Lenny, and thanks to all of you. I wish you the best, and, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll all get through this. Uh, I don't want to end on a bummer note. I mean, I think we will get through it, but I do have, that's what keeps me up at, like, at least. But most of all, gratitude to all of you, and I wish you the best. Well, thank you. Uh...